one on -one training. Yeah. Well, again, I always appreciate you taking time to chat a little bit more. And then so uh, I'm going to pull up the post that I came across and I'm going to have you educate us all on what your thoughts are. And, you know, it's, it's tough because I think from a student's perspective, we're trying to get our interns to become more comfortable reading studies. And I think that's a huge flaw with new trainers as they, they learn a certification, they go through NASM, ACE, whatever it may be, and they only teach them how to critically think. And so they get that piece of paper and then they go out there and now it's just, there's so much information. And so unfortunately I believe, and I see it a lot, that new trainers believe someone who has a lot of followers. And so they think that followers equal education. And you have a cool name like Paint Pain Academy. It's like, shit, these guys must know what they're talking about. And I'm not saying that they're not, that they don't. I don't really know much about them, but this is going off of Arash and I. We went in our last talk, we, we addressed Jonda and the upper cross, lower cross, and coordination distortion syndromes. And how there's just a really big group out there that will take static posture. And it's like, oh, you, you have a little bit of this, your, your shoulders are going to fall off and you're going to die within a week. And, yeah. and so I think that when you get stuff like this, it sounds great. I mean, squat and imbalances and you're either avoiding this exercise because it hurts or you're consistently adjusting your feet and you're trying to find that perfect position, but you can't. And then it's an imbalance. And then they get into some, you know, some stuff, but you still can't squat. And they really go down that uh, imbalance with everything. And, and as, you, as you guys know, I think that there's a huge – since it's a free market, there's a huge opportunity for associations like NASM to have like a corrective exercise certification. And then all of a sudden these, these trainers will think that they know everything. Like, oh, I can fix you. You have an imbalance. You have, oh, you failed the FMS. You got a zero. I got to fix you. And so I was hoping that we could talk a little bit more about this today. Yeah. So for starters, we need to acknowledge that no movement is always going to be perfectly balanced. And you can put it as simple as every single squat that you do, there's gonna be small nuances and variations with how low you go, uh, how much weight you push through each side. Maybe you shift your weight a little bit forward, maybe you shift your weight a little bit backwards. I think perfection and balance is it's something that we try to apply to everything in life. And it's no different with exercising and movement. However, we need to understand and respect that movement is not always going to be perfectly balanced. And if we think about the human body, it's not perfectly balanced from the get-go. You know what I mean? Like we, we have different amounts of lobes of our lungs on one side compared to the opposite side. We don't have two livers. We don't have two spleens. Like if we just break it down to simple anatomy and even our organs, like it's not perfectly balanced. So with human movement, it's really no different. Yes, with a squat, you're going to want to try to keep your weight 50-50, but there's going to be some minor changes with maybe some pelvic rotation, uh, maybe one ankle moves a little bit different than the other for we can't we don't have really good research nor should we ever 100 percent depend on the fact that imbalances are going to lead to issues it's just not there isn't substantial evidence to show it and support it like we can't it's the chicken or the egg or the egg or the chicken you know what i mean okay yeah. or, you're, you're squatting, your left shoulder blade is rounding forward, so you're gonna deal with left shoulder issues. Well, maybe that person has a history of left shoulder issues and that's why they're squatting that way, or maybe that's just, that's the pattern that they know that they're efficient with. So it's, I think, appreciate differences in movements from side to side, but you can't, you can't hold on to hard correlations in terms of, okay, I see this, and that means that that person is set up for this to happen. It's just a matter of you appreciate it, you respect it, decide if you want to make a change with it or not. But we can't say that if we see an imbalance, 
or if we see some sort of dysfunction and even labeling stuff dysfunctional is a is a hot debate just because you see those things doesn't mean that it's an issue or that it's going to become an issue yeah and so i mean that's probably kind of relating to nutrition to do a little side topic but in the nutrition you hear a lot of like oh that's bad food it's good food cheat so it's all how you label things and i can only imagine when someone wants to begin exercise and they, and they come to the professional and they have a clipboard and they have them do an overhead squat and they have them put them in these positions that they've never done before and then the trainer starts labeling them, oh, you're dysfunctional, and you have this wrong, and you have this wrong. Well, imagine inside the brain, it's just like red flag, red flag, red flag, so there's going to be some guarding. Yeah. And so like when you, what would you coach a new trainer And when it comes to movement? And you know, yeah, we want to look for certain checkpoints, like your big toe, little toe, heel should be on the ground when we're squatting, and your knees should be going through your toes, and it's okay if they go a little past your toes, a little bit of valgus isn't the end of the world. Maybe a little bit of varus isn't the end of the world. So it's this fine line of, it's like almost like a U-shaped curve. We don't want perfection. We want progression. But where do you find that fine line? Yeah, I think as a trainer, when you're working with a new client or you're even working with a, an old client or a current client, it just comes down to keep it simple and, and ask yourself, what is the needs analysis for this client? If I'm working with someone and they're coming to me because they want to get stronger so that they can pick up their kid, just be able to pick them up off the grounds, but the kid is now older and then they're not picking the kid up overhead. It's like, do I need to do an overhead squat assessment? Mm -hmm. Maybe I just need to assess how they pick a heavy object off the ground. So let me ask how, how heavy their child is. And okay, let's take a look at you picking up an object that weighs that much. So it just comes down to a needs analysis. How does that person move? How do they need to move? And what exercises are going to be similar to those movements that you can take a look at and that you can work on? And again, it's if you work on those exercises and you work on improving those movements, hopefully there's gonna be some carryover to improving that person's function with those movements, but also don't forget about specificity. And maybe picking up the child isn't the, the best example because you're not always gonna go home and tell your client to do three sets of uh, 15 kid pickups. Mm -hmm. But you know what I mean? It's, there's, there's a level of general fitness that you wanna work on with all your clients and just general well being, being able to move well. But don't also forget about the specificity rule and the skills. So if you're working with any clients that they play sports, well, make sure that they're also spending time playing that sport and maybe watch how they perform that sport. I think it's actually it's beautiful because it's so simple. And what we like to do is we we make it a lot more challenging. And so, and you can use that baby as the you know overload principle as well. So you can pick up something and as it gets heavier, you're going to improve. But what I see so much of is you take that scenario. They don't look at the specificity. They look at how can we make this hard for my client. Let's put them on a BOSU ball and let's have them close one eye and then try to pick up this kettlebell in a you know in a rotational aspect. And so then it is hard <laughs> and the client falls right. off. And then I feel for the clients because then they, they're like, Oh wow, you're right. And then the trainers taught all these words like proprioception and Oh, your core is weak. And, and they use all this vernacular that kind of scares the shit out of the clients. But I wonder in your, in your professional opinion, what are some tests or not tests? I would say more screens that maybe are irrelevant because I'm thinking about the trainer that gets certified and there's a lot of you guys are listening right now. You probably NASA some certified. You go into an Equinox, okay? So now at Equinox, you got to drink the FMS punch. And functional movement screening, great cook, super, super smart dude. But they've studied it. And it's pretty much as efficient as a, a flip of a coin, right? And so, but you're taught that. And you have to do that at Equinox. And you got to do this. And you got to do all these screens. And then you leave. And I don't know if the trainer's been given the tools to think critically and so are there some tests that you think that maybe are overdone or maybe we should look at eliminating or what are your thoughts on those movement screens and stuff? Yeah, I think as a trainer, it's, it's not the worst thing in the world to get exposed to different systems like the FMS because 
it helps a new trainer to create their own system. You know what I mean? As a, as a trainer, regardless of who you go through, of course, I definitely recommend show up because you guys are, you're on it. You know what I mean? You're, you're taking it to the next level and it's not cookie cutter. Um, so hats off to you really taking personal training education to the next level. Uh, because it's very different than what I got as a personal trainer. <laughs> but with that being said, when you're a personal trainer and you're going through education, you are building a toolbox. And that toolbox, when you start out, you get a big box, you know, and maybe you got a show up sticker on it, or maybe you got an Equinox sticker on it. But then what you're doing is when you're learning, or if you go through any sort of certification, you're adding tools to that toolbox. And think of the, SMS, the FMS as you're adding a tool to your toolbox. It's, it can be helpful for some trainers, as well as any assessment for that matter. And we can dive into which assessments I would definitely recommend, but it's, it's going to help give the trainer exposure to, okay, these are, these are different movements that may be worthwhile taking my client through. And it's going to help with building a rhythm as well as a flow to just getting a general overview of how well someone moves and what the person is capable of. It's a matter of what's, what's more important than just taking people through movements is how are you digesting the information from those movements? You know, it's, it's, it can be paralysis by analysis if you just get too much data and you're not, you're just collecting so much data, but it really doesn't mean anything to you if you're just doing it for the sake of doing it because you were taught it or you're supposed to do it because your job says so. So again, it just comes back to the needs analysis and you gotta have a candid conversation with your clients and ask them, what, why is it that they're seeing you? And is it, we can, we can even keep it simple there as well. Is it they're seeing you for mobility? Are they seeing you for strength? Are they seeing you for aesthetics, how they look? Are they seeing you for how they feel? Or do they have some other sort of specific targeted goal that they're working on? And when you have that conversation, that's when, okay, you identify their goals. And now here are those goals in front of me. Let's just pick two or three of them. And now let me look at my toolbox to see, can I get a baseline to work towards their goal? So if it's someone wants to get stronger, okay, well, we need to just start with a strength assessment so, we did, so, we did, so that we get a baseline value for where their strength is. And you can do 10 rep max testing, you can do one rep max testing, you can do time to fatigue. Like there's, there's many different tests that you, you, know, you guys probably review as well as you can encourage for self-learning. But I think just as a trainer, it's you're going to you're going to learn what assessments and tests are valuable the more that you work with clients and, and the more that you work through cases and just document that stuff, add those tools to your toolbox, do research on it if you if you want to get more well versed with it, practice it with other trainers that are in the same internship as as that are in the same internship as you, review it with you, Chris. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it totally depends. I, I wouldn't say here's a, here's a one-all be-all assessment uh, because it, it just totally depends. Mm -hmm. I think that's great because for those of you that don't know what the needs analysis is, they, they use that with like an SCA and they have a little breakdown of your know, bioenergetics, muscles used, muscles engaged and injuries. And really just taking and asking good open-ended questions. And if you're, like you said, your client wants to get stronger, uh, help them get stronger. And it's fascinating because coming from a strength background, and I worked at, you know, University of Connecticut, and I'm a CSCS. And it's just funny, when you work with athletes, it just makes so much more sense. Because if you have a basketball player that comes in, how are you going to assess them? Are you going to start throwing them, you know, golf balls? No, that's stupid. They don't do that. You give them a ball, and you do some basic drills. You have them shoot. And then you find out where they need them to improve. So it's like in business, you got a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's like the same with movement. You see what they're good at, and then you help them move better. 
So why is it that these, these, I see so much of the devices and stuff, and then the trainers get frustrated because they're implementing all this bullshit, and mm-hmm. then the clients don't get results, they leave, and the trainer gets frustrated. And I think that's where it comes down to is the, the entry standards. And what you're saying is you need experience, but experience will only help you so much if you don't, if you, if you don't have that foundation, you're kind of fucked. So that's yeah. why they need to go, you go hand in hand. And, and then you guys come from a great background, obviously, because you went through school and then you get to learn that and apply it. And that's, I think, a really good foundation because you're given the tools. So now your toolbox is complete almost, but now you got to add it into it. Yeah. And I would love to touch on a few of those things because you said it best where, okay, it's, it seems easier when you work with an athlete because I think for personal training, it just ends up being a little bit on the, the higher level compared to lower level stuff. If we're talking about personal training versus rehab, but you bring up a really good point where we talked about the disconnect from assessment to what you end up implementing. And unfortunately with Instagram and social media, If it's not sexy, if it's not catching your eye, then you're going to lose a lot of people's attention. But at the same time, you got to think, whose attention do you want? So I was listening to a podcast today and you see where people are going to jump up onto a box and there's a BOSU on it and they got to land perfectly on the BOSU. You got to think to yourself, who is watching that video? Either it's the random person that is just hoping that person busts their ass and they're waiting for them to fall, or it's someone in the fitness industry that is saying, why the hell are they doing that? And is this person going to fall or not? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's more entertainment than it is truly education and learning. Whereas if you post a video that has a lot of value to it, you're going to get the right people watching it. It may not have as many views but you're going to get the attention of people who's in, whose attention that you're trying to get. You know, it's, I don't, I don't want a million views where there is wrong intentions from the get go for why they were viewing that. And then I can talk about my own experience because before grad school, I got my CSCS. I was at Penn state. I did coursework there that helps prepare for either the AS, the ACSM, the NASM or the NSCA. I rolled with the NSCA, just read the textbook and took the test. But, it, but for me, I didn't feel ready. You know, I, I did that. I just went into personal training and I just, I just trained people and I totally did the BOSU stuff. So you really, you're going to be the best trainer if you're putting yourself in an environment where you can learn, but you're also getting guidance. And you're getting guidance from people that have experience. You're not just getting guidance from a textbook because the textbook doesn't adapt. The textbook doesn't update and teach you what you can do case to case or actually work through stuff. You know what I mean? So I love that you do the internship because I think for a personal trainer, it's, it's amazing to learn everything that you need to learn, practice it yourself along with classmates. And then more importantly, actually get to do an internship where you're working with clients and then you're getting feedback. Like for us, when we were in grad school, the best year of grad school was our last year when we were in the clinic three days a week, but then we were in class two days a week and we were working with our faculty and we were working with our mentors to be like, Hey, I saw this on Monday. This is what I remember learning from coursework from reading my textbook and the slides However, when I was working with this individual, it didn't add up. And that's where the mentorship and the faculty, they come into play from their experience. And that's what's going to make you the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just, uh, there's, there's so much that goes into it. And when you're given the right tools, that's a great analogy with it. It's not, I just love making fun of NASA. And that's just one of my funny things to do. But <laughs> you, know, you can still be given that toolbox. And as long as you have that mentality where you get the right mentorship, you get someone who can help you. And identify where it's just it's unfortunate the trainers they seek more pieces of paper when those pieces of paper don't necessarily make you better you got to yeah. get around the right people that can really you know bring you up 
So yeah. no, I appreciate you taking your time today. This is awesome. I always love picking your guys' brains and, and learning from you. And I, I'm proud to say that I don't have any current injuries that I need help with. So oh, nice. will we'll probably fix me on something. But <laughs> Sounds like the hamstring is doing better. It is. It is. Little by yeah. little, it's, I can finally. So this is how my meat head works. It's like, I'll tell you, three days ago, it was finally good. I'm like, I should do some sprints. <laughs> but then I'm like, okay, hold on. Let's just, uh, <laughs> let's just be grateful I'm not in pain. <clears throat> Yeah. And then, you know, we can talk about sprints a little bit. And then I want to make one more note about the FMS. So for you, when you're ready to jump back into those sprints, it's like do a really good warm up and then start with incline sprints versus flat sprints. Because with an incline sprint, there less, there's a less footfall, meaning that there's less, there's going to be less eccentric work on your hamstring at a really long length uh, because you're constantly running to a ground that's higher to you. So a nice progression getting back into sprints is start with incline sprints. Great, I appreciate and then that the one last note that I wanted to make about the FMS is you mentioned it earlier. Like, would you take an athlete through the FMS and expect that assessment to tell you everything? And it's like, no, because the FMS ultimately is low threshold, low energy movements. Yeah. So if you're seeing a client and they're telling you about goals that are high energy or things that they want to get back to that are high threshold activities, well, there's going to be a disconnect if you use low threshold stuff when you're really trying to look at high threshold. You can argue that there may be some value to make sure that the person can do some of the low threshold stuff, but also if you're looking at low threshold stuff and then putting people on BOSU balls, it's like, well, What's the, what's the connection there? So take every single assessment with a grain of salt. There is no perfect assessment. There is no perfect standalone assessment. It's ultimately the full picture of all the personal, all the, all the clients' information, all the assessments you did, and their goals, and how do you connect all the dots? So like first, collect all the dots, and then connect the dots. And that's going to help you with making better informed decisions about what assessments you should do moving forward when it comes time to retesting. And then what should your programming be so that you're working towards the goals? Well, that's great. That's such a, that's a perfect little conclusion right there. So, well, we, we learned a lot today from you and I appreciate everything that you guys are doing.